Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel and thanks for checking out the channel. Now, uh, maybe you're just getting back from one of the radio stores and you saw a radio like the FT60 on the shelves and you want to know more about it. Well, that's why I'm here today. Or maybe you're just getting into amateur radio and you've decided that you want a one step up from a entry level handy talkie radio. That's why I'm here today. Today I'm going to give you an overview of the Yesu FT60. And notice I said it's an overview. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some of the specifications, go over the features, walk through the menu, and uh, I'll even let you listen a little bit on the transmit and the receive of the radio to give you an idea how the radio sounds. So during that time, I'll try to kind of keep my opinions to myself and I'll try to give you information specific to the FT60. With that, this is going to be a long episode, but if you ever get stuck, confused, or have any questions, feel free to rewind the video and uh, you could maybe just watch that section again or fast forward the video. But this video is supposed to be a lot of detail about what is the Yezu FT60. And I hope you enjoy this video. Let's get started. The Yezu FT60 is a tried and true radio. What do I mean by that? This thing was announced back in Hamvention 2004, <laughs> meaning that this radio series is nearly 20 years old. And with that, 20 years, I think it's finally time to make a good video about a detailed overview of this radio. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about as much as I can regarding the specifications of this radio, the weight of this radio, the advertised power consumption. We're going to go through the menus. I will show you the different frequency ranges. I'll let you see how this sounds. I'm going to do my best to be detailed in this overview, kind of like my old videos. In another episode, we'll talk more in depth and I'll show you how to actually manually program this radio for things like repeat repeaters, as well as saving things into the memory. You may see that a couple of times today. So before we get started though, let's actually draw out a plan. And that plan is gonna help me stay on topic. But it also helps you kind of figure out where we're gonna go next with everything, right? So with that plan, let's today talk about number one, the Yezu nomenclature. We're just going to call it the nomenclature, okay? And what is the nomenclature? That's basically the characteristics of the radio. For example, if I was to say a AR-15 rifle is a lightweight, air-cooled, gas-operated, magazine-fed weapon, those would be the nomenclature or the characteristics of that particular device. Now, we're going to talk about the nomenclature of this device. After we talk about the nomenclature and some of the uh, features of this radio, then we're gonna navigate through the menu and talk about the actual features inside the menu, okay? We're gonna go further and we're gonna talk about how does this radio sound, okay? On transmit, meaning I'm gonna have a nice SDR hooked up somewhere and I'll be recording that SDR and you'll get to hear how this sounds on transmit, but also on receive. Meaning, how does this sound on AM airband? How does this sound on FM mode? And so forth. Now, we're probably going to go into step four, which even though today I'm not showing you how to program this radio, I will show you things like how to scan or access memories and banks. Oops. And with that being said, real quick, I want to go back up here to nomenclature. And nomenclature does include everything about the radio, such as the type of receiver it has, the oh, the frequencies that it uh, receives on and transmits on, and so forth. With that being said, now that we kind of have a general idea of where we're going, it's going to be a fairly long episode. Don't be afraid to rewind it if you don't understand something, but I will keep this as simple as possible. That's what I do. Let's start with... The beginning. Uh, so as I kind of mentioned already, in 2004 at Dayton Hamvention is when I believe this radio was announced and it's been going strong since then. I have read reports online specifically toward the beginning of 2023 that this radio has been discontinued. There's no indication of that as far as I could see and I have no affiliation with Yezu. In fact, this radio, it came to me from a silent key. But in 2004, this radio has been announced, and I, that makes this almost a 20-year line of a radio. So that should tell you something about the quality of this radio. Now, it's a little bit heavy, and maybe we should get into that first. And so let's start with the weight of the radio. 
if you have everything on the radio, the belt clip, the battery, which is a nickel metal hydrate, hydride, hydride, sorry, it's nickel metal hydride. And I have a hard time saying that. So you'll hear that more. Battery and the antenna, we're in something like 9.6 ounces. Hold on a second here, where is? I know this isn't probably the, you know, most <laughs> accurate. If for you Americans out there, 0.811 pounds, and then for everybody else, it's 12.98 ounces. 12.98 ounces, that is a heavy radio. And a lot of that probably has to do with this nickel metal hydrate battery. On the battery itself, it's talking about nomenclature, right? On the battery itself, there's a clip holding the battery into place. And so this clip is on the bottom of the radio. And as you unclip it, you hear that audio, audible click. You could press this belt uh, clip, which is very durable and strong. You can press it up and remove the battery. Talking about that belt clip though, it is removable. As you can see right there, there's two holes which lead to two Phillips head screws and those can be removed to remove the belt clip if you wish. On the inside of the radio, kind of hiding where the battery would be is your sticker that shows your serial number, it shows your model number and so forth. So for example, this serial number is uh, 7L561129. I wonder if we could date to see how old this is. Sorry if that's not focusing for you. And actually, I just took a quick break here. If you look above the serial number, which I know you're probably not gonna be able to see, but there is something there that shows IC511B 2017 5X, I think 2-0. It, my indicator would probably say that that means this is a 2017. If you have the battery out, by the way, this, this clip here that holds the battery in a place located on the bottom of the radio, uh, it's a strong little piece of plastic, to be honest. I wonder if it's made of ABS or something, but I will tell you that if you drop it the wrong way, it looks like it probably has the potential to bend, break off of the radio itself. So just be a little careful of that, but I do think that it's probably pretty decent quality. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna plug the radio back in, or the battery back into the radio. Now, the battery itself is advertised as a 1400 milliamp hour battery. I have no reason to you know, believe it's not or anything like that. I could test this at a later date, but this is the FNB83. I should mention that everything I received on this radio uh, was from the silent key. So maybe this isn't an original battery, but by my research, everything indicates that this 1400 milliamp hour um, somebody will yell at me for calling it milliamp hours. This 1.4 amp hour, <laughs> 1400 milliamp hour battery uh, is nickel metal hydrate, and it's pretty heavy. This alone though, if we're going back to weight, is about half of the weight of the total combined weight. Uh, the radio and antenna without the battery, 6.74 ounces. The battery itself, 6.21 ounces, so it's a pretty heavy battery is what I'm getting at there. Uh, additionally though, let's go ahead and plug this battery back in. There's two teeth in the top here. The battery's gonna slide in from the bottom. As you can see here, I'm on an angle, and then I'm just gonna kind of press down. And there's not much else to it except don't forget to clip that bottom clip, and you'll hear it audibly click into place. Now you can see here the battery is in place pretty good. It's a nice um, flush connection you know you don't see anything bulging up on the battery where it meets the radio itself let's talk about more nomenclature <laughs> and we're going to talk about the antenna now this antenna is uh, a sma male antenna which means the port on the radio itself should be an sma female yep an sma female port and it does come with this little spacer right here what is a spacer good for right well the spacer is placed here because sometimes without it on certain antennas, you might screw down and have a little bit of a gap like you see there. If you lose your space or don't worry, it's not the end of the world or anything, you could typically go to a hardware store and go to the hardware section and find one of these little spacers, rubber spacers that will fit. Uh, if you're having a problem finding one, you could always just ask you know somebody at the store, hey, uh, do you guys have a spacer that might fit this? Bring your radio in, they'll find one. But as you can see here, this one itself is kind of recessed on one side and one side it's flat. So I'm gonna place the reset side down 
just like this toward the body. And then I'm gonna place the antenna or screw the antenna back in. If you were looking for an aftermarket antenna on here, I bet it could go the other way, but it's fine the way it is. If you were ever looking to replace an antenna, again, you would be looking for a recessed SMA male like you see here. This is a Redivis antenna that I've had pretty good luck with and maybe we'll talk about that some other day. But I do have the antenna back in now. I'm not tightening it so tight where it's like super tight because you could potentially, if you turn the antenna too much, you could potentially break the SMA port. And so, you know, just a nice little turn until it becomes hard or resistive, if you will. Resistant? Resistive. You get it. We know about the antenna. We know about the battery. We know about the belt clip. The charger that comes with the radio is not going to be this one. Uh, this is a aftermarket uh, charger that I had to purchase, but I placed this on... I place this onto here and the wasn't really made for that. There we go. I place this onto here. I'll have a red light indicator when it's charging. Uh, during that time though, with an external charger like this, it probably wouldn't be wise to leave your radio on receive. Although some people do it, I understand it's not the best practice. However, that brings us to our next point. On the side of the radio, we have on the, if you're looking at the face of the radio on the right hand side, we have a, a little cover that has two slots. The first cover is for an external microphone speaker. And so, you know, they make those headsets where there's a speaker and there's a microphone. You could plug that in. It's a single plug design and you could use an external headset if you wished. But on the bottom is the external DC port, which means you could plug in a DC charger to the radio directly. And uh, at that point, it should be okay to have your radio on while it's charging and so forth. Because uh, also you probably could transmit at that point too, because at that point when you transmit, I think this one is not a, a, a for sure, but I think that's bypassing the battery so that you can do things like transmit without damaging the battery. If that's incorrect, I'm sure the comments will let us all know um, and hopefully respectfully. Because remember, there are people who are just getting into radio and if they see your comment, maybe it'll change their concept or their mind for the better or the worse of amateur radio. And now we're gonna go to the other side. Let me get that out of the way. The other side of the radio, the left side. And I have spoken in the past about particularly the FT65R and the FT4R. I'm not necessarily, I believe I said that I'm not necessarily a fan of their push buttons. Although it might've been the 70D. Basically, there's other radios that have like a lip that come out for the push to talk. This push to talk is located on the top left hand side of the radio. It's a larger push to talk button, uh, about an inch, an inch and a quarter in length. But the thing is, is it's flat. So that means the radio's not on. That means that it's really easy to press. I don't know if you could hear that. I'm pretty content with that. It's This fits in the hand really nice, right? Um, I would say that I have large hands. Here's a, here for scale, here's a little bit of a ruler. Um, but this fits in my hands fairly nice and I'm able to basically hold it like this and hit the transmit button with the speaker being right here for me to hear. And we'll talk about the receiver in a little bit, but also the microphone being right here. Uh, one of the things I used to do when I was new into radio, maybe I still do it, is uh, you'd hold the radio like this to transmit. That's great, and it might work maybe if you're down on an angle like this, but you're kind of covering the microphone at that point, so there could be some muffled audio on the other end where people are hearing you. So here you go, just like that. Below that is what they call a squelch break. When you have this radio on, we'll talk about the squelch in just a moment, but when you have this radio on and you have it properly adjusted, you, you might not hear anything. And that's normal if there's no conversations. Sometimes though, you wanna hear what's going on in the static. And to do that, you could hit the, well, you could adjust the, stat, the squelch all the way down, but that kind of becomes inconvenient. Instead, you could just hit the squelch break button right below. I don't hear anything, but now I know that I I'm not missing a station that's very faint, for example. And then finally below that is what would be the lamp illumination button located right here. When I hit that, the lamp on the keypad as well as the LCD display illuminate. 
Which kind of does bring us into our next point. Uh, again, we've kind of spoke about the buttons on the left-hand side of the radio for the nomenclature. We spoke about the features on the right-hand side of the radio being the external DC charger and the microphone uh, speaker input. We talked about the speaker briefly, and we have spoke about the microphone as well. Spoke about the battery and the antenna, which leads us here to actually turning on the radio and how the radio functions. To turn on the radio, on the top of the radio, there's two knobs located to the right of the antenna. Okay, knob number one is the middle one, is what we're going to call it. And simply, if you turn it clockwise, you're going to feel and hear an audio click. Audible click, excuse me. And then you'll hear doo doo doo, which means the radio is turning on. And as you can see, it turned on to 146.520 because that's where I turned it on to. As I turn the radio to the uh, clockwise, as I turn it to the right more, the volume will increase. And as I turn it to the left more, the volume will decrease until I turn it all the way and feel that click again. And I'll turn the radio off. Okay. And so, actually, how does the radio sound? at its lowest volume versus its highest volume. And we're still talking about nomenclature, but since we're here, let's just take a look at that real quick. For this portion of the demonstration, I went to a NOAA weather radio frequency that I know doesn't exist, okay? Uh, I'm gonna go further into getting into VFO mode in just a moment, which means I can manually input a frequency. But this helps demonstrate the next knob, which I'm at 162. 600 and NOAA weather radio is at 162.500 near me. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn my volume up just a little bit. Okay. And then I'm going to use the knob to the right. Now the knob to the right has two different knobs in it. Technically one's the squelch knob, which is a smooth knob toward the bottom of the knob on the right. If I go all the way counterclockwise, it opens the squelch. If I go all the way clockwise, it tightens the squelch. What does that mean? Well, if I have less of a squelch setting, for example, we'll call this squelch one right here. Basically, I have adjusted the squelch so it's just above the noise level. It's going to be more sensitive to receiving and uh, allowing audio to come through the speaker. Whereas if I turn it all the way to the right or clockwise, that signal better be very strong that I'm picking up because it's not going to break the squelch or it's not going to output onto the speaker unless that squelch is, or unless that signal is super strong. Uh, and so basically let's go back to here and bring it up to a nice little spot right there. So I'm barely breaking or I'm barely, barely above the noise level, I guess is how you would say it. Okay. But also then I'm at 162.600. My local NOAA weather radio is 162.500 and that's what this knob on top does. The knob that's attached to the SQL knob but actually is clickable. Uh, let me see if you could hear this. Let me adjust that. Let me see if you could hear this. That's me adjusting this knob right here. Okay, so I'm basically changing the frequencies as you could see right here, 575, 550, 525, 500. And here's how it sounds. Chance of precipitation 50%. And that's with the volume semi low right here. A chance of showers in the evening. Lows in the mid 60s. Chance of precipitation 40%. Monday, partly cloudy. A chance of shower. Now you might actually hear a little bit of static in there. Although this NOAA weather radio station is fairly close. And I assure you it has to do with RFI being generated all around me with computer monitors and LEDs and fancy lights, which I try not to use unless I'm recording. But uh, there is a nice audio and to this. the marine portion of the forecast for Southern Lake Michigan. And in a future episode, I will compare the audio quality of this to other uh, radios of similar type. Because this radio does have some extra features, which I think we're going to get into right now. Because we talked about everything externally, except maybe the keypad, which we're going to get into in just a moment. Uh, let's talk about the actual specifications of this radio. And I think now we're going to start talking about, you know, maybe features of this radio and, and actually getting a little bit more in depth to what specifications this radio has to offer. Of course, it's an FCC certified radio. And there's three main features that would, I guess, typically set this radio apart 
from other radios at that time and, and maybe even now as well. Okay, so if I had to tell you what three features were that I think make this radio stand apart, uh, of course, this is subjective because this is a, an opinion. You know, I, I am giving this opinion. But I think that the number one thing that most people like about this radio is the fact that it has a very wide range of receiving. For example, this allows you to access and listen to air bands. It does have the ability to uh, have like certain NOAA weather radio stations scanning as well. Um, but having the ability to receive air bands is great. Uh, going through the specifications here, receiving 108 megahertz through 200 megahertz, allowing you to transmit on two meter band or 144 through 148, allowing you to also receive on 200 megahertz through 299 megahertz, 300 megahertz to 399 megahertz, 400 megahertz to 520 megahertz, allowing you again to transmit within the 70 centimeter amateur radio band. And then finally, 700 megahertz to 999 megahertz. Of course, cellular is blocked. Excuse me, cell, cellular is blocked. I don't know why I'm having a hard time with that word. Of course, there is information that I didn't receive a manual with this, so I did get a lot of information online, and I'll do my best to post those links below to, to help you out, but also to give credit where credit is due. That's pretty good though. We have a lot of receive capabilities and we could transmit on two meters and 70 centimeters. Somebody will ask and the answer is yes. Uh, you could do Mars mods uh, to basically unlock this radio for frequencies that weren't, I don't want to say weren't necessarily intended to be transmitted on, but frequencies that are outside the amateur radio band. I'm not here to give public opinion and I really don't care. It's a great radio. And if you choose to use this for GMRS, it's going to be a lot cleaner than some radios. Dang it, I gave an opinion. <laughs> this next part I don't know a lot about, so I will just kind of briefly tell you about it, what I think it means. And uh, hopefully you, somebody will speak up in the comments below because we don't want to provide anybody misinformation, especially if you're looking for your first radio. What I can tell you for sure is the Yaesu FT60R uses a double conversion Supro heterodyne receiver. And what I would tell you is, is if you listen to one of these next to a radio that doesn't offer a double conversion Supro heterodyne receiver, the Yaesu FT60 is going to sound better. And this is where I can't tell you much more. Uh, because I'm not going to be completely accurate. I'll try, though. And again, the comments below might let us know otherwise, hopefully respectfully, because somebody watching this video might be their first time in a radio, and we want to leave a good impression on them. So better image rejection is what this radio might allow for with that double conversion Supro heterodyne receiver. Uh, better selectivity and better frequency stability is kind of a few things that I believe the double conversion Supro heterodyne receiver is good for. Well, what else could I tell you about the radio? The third reason that somebody may want to purchase this radio is it is a solid built radio. It's, it's heavy, yes, but uh, you could definitely tell that there's a lot of quality in this radio. Uh, the plastics are definitely strong enough to withstand a fall, even though I don't want to let this radio fall. A lot of times you'll see me do torture tests on radios, but when it came from a silent key, that kind of feels wrong. Uh, so with that, too, there's a lot more we could talk about as far as the specifications of this radio. Uh, we could talk about the output power, up to 5 watts of output power. And, you know, maybe that's a good time for us to start going into depth on the menus. So, see, this naturally kind of progresses from the nomenclature into still talking about some of the features, specifications, but also going through the menu. So, as I turn the radio on, I'm on 162.500 again, NOAA weather radio. And I'm going to just change that to 146.520. Uh, that's the national simplex frequency. I don't plan on transmitting. However, in order to change our power levels, remember I said up to 5 watts, for example, on 2 meters, there's this button down here that has an F and a W on it, okay? This button, if we hit this, we could actually find on our keypad all these little shortcuts, if you will, such as our squelch type, the code for the squelch, the transmit power. So if I were to hit F, and while the keypad is still illuminated, there's a little F that appears on the screen. It'll disappear if I don't do anything quick enough. But while it's still illuminated, I hit three, I get into the menu that shows the power settings for the radio. 
And like I said, up to five watts on high, but we also have two other modes, which would be mid power and low power. On mid power, you're doing about two watts on two meters. And then on low power, you're doing somewhere around a half of a watt. And a lot of people will ask about the battery life and so forth. I'll have a video out on that later in the future. But remember, if you have a lower transmit power, you're gonna conserve battery. And so I guess that's kind of a, another good reason to point out that it's always good to make a transmission with the minimal amount of power necessary to make the communication, because not only are you not blasting out RF, you know, places where you maybe don't need to go or as far out as you should, but also you're conserving the battery on your handy talkie or HT radio. Yezu does specify in their manual certain uh, battery life characteristics for the FNB83 battery, which I might not see in this one. Again, this is a used radio. So if you purchase a used radio, the battery may be depleted or not properly charged, so forth. Um, however, they say on two meters uh, with a duty cycle based on five watts of power and six minutes of transmitting, six minutes of receive, uh, with audio and 48 minutes of RX squelched or receive squelched, you could expect somewhere around nine hours of battery life. That sounds pretty high to me. I'll be kind of curious for a 1400 milliamp hour battery. I'll be kind of curious to know, you know, how that does. But also then on 430 megahertz at a five watt power, so forth, uh, should last up to about eight hours. And then finally for receive only about 15 hours. I will say that I have had uh, the Yaesu FT70D and I did a live stream a long, long time ago. And just on receive only, I was receiving NOAA weather radio. It was somewhere around, I don't remember the exact number, but 16 hours. So the receive life doesn't necessarily seem that high. And the nice thing is it's a removable battery. So you could always have multiple batteries if you needed or replacement batteries if you needed. In fact, since I don't know the quality of this battery, I'll probably buy a, I'm going to have to buy an actual Yezu or Vertex one so that when I write the review or do the review video, you know, you'll be able to get uh, an idea of the actual battery life and not just some secondhand battery. But uh, it is nice that I could have the ability to replace those if needed. Now, that's basically the, the basic nomenclature of this radio. There are a lot more features of this radio. And I think the best thing for me to do is to kind of continue this to go through the menus. And as I go through the menus, we'll talk about like how to access certain features, what's in the menus. One thing I noticed that doesn't appear to be in the menus is what would be known as a, a Vox or voice activated transmit feature. Um, interesting to me, but then if I wanted to use this radio with something like the all-in-one cable, I don't necessarily know how that would be possible or if it would be possible. Whereas some radios that are, are relatively inexpensive, I just have one laying around here, uh, relatively inexpensive, maybe have uh, Vox, you know? So as I'm talking, I don't need to hit the push to talk. It hears my voice and it transmits. I don't like that feature typically, except when I'm doing something like, like I mentioned, using an all-in-one cable, which allows me to beacon my APRS via cell phone. Um, so that may or may not be a huge feature to you, but I did want to point out that this radio doesn't appear to have that. And if I were to go in the menu here, so for example, if I were to hit the F button, we have the little F being displayed on here, and I'm going to hit one. Now we can start getting into our different types of uh, menu features. And we're going to start with the shortcuts on the keypad. Usually and typically the shortcuts on the keypad are the most important things that you'll need to know or need to access on the radio or within the menu. Um, so for example, right now I'm on tone and that was because I went F for the, we're going to call it the shortcut key. And then I hit one for squelch type and I could turn that off by adjusting whoop, wrong button. That's okay. So I'm going to do it again, F one. And here I am at tone again. And I'm going to adjust using the selector knob on the right hand side, which would also change the frequencies or if you were in memory mode, change the channels. But I just have this off for right now. And in order to save that, all I have to do is hit that F button again. And I'm back to the main menu or the main screen rather with the frequency on there. Perhaps you don't see a frequency on there, but you see something like a channel number on there. 
You could easily fix that by just hitting the bottom button here that says V slash M. That means VFO mode, uh, or if you want to call it uh, like a manual uh, frequency mode, or M mode, which would be memory mode. And so I'm going to hit it, and you can even see it said memory, and then I jump into the memories, which I don't really have anything programmed in here. So it just takes me to this memory here. If I were to use the selector knob and I had other frequencies programmed into here, I would use the knob to go left and right to go channel up or channel down. Now this radio uh, does have the ability for up to a thousand channels. Should I say over a thousand memory channels to be saved with the, as the guide or the user manual suggests, with the alpha numeric. So basically I could put in something like the, um, uh, the W9 FFF repeater or W9 FFF All-Star wouldn't fit in there, but maybe AS. Uh, so it's, it doesn't have to always just be the frequencies that are being displayed, but you could display something like the, the repeater name. Let me give you an example here real quick. I'll be right back. Again, this isn't a tutorial about how to program the radio, and we will get to that. I'll make sure that's an in-depth tutorial. However, this also does help us access the menus further. As I mentioned and we're talking about is the shortcuts on the keypad, but there's also an, a way to access the full menu by hitting the function button, or as I call it, the shortcut button, the F button, and then hitting zero, we get into this advanced or menu system, if you will. And here we could do things like, we'll go through all these settings, but you could do things like, uh, 27, option 27, your name. And what does that mean? Well, I could basically display the new alpha or the numeric information of the repeater. So if I'm on alpha, for example, and I save this up, it says N9 HEP, but what if I go back to here and I go to here and I change this to, uh, again, we will get into all this, but if I change it to frequency, what displays at that point? 145.330. So there are options with it. I like to have the actual name. Why do I like the name? Because, you know, for example, a repeater could be the same in multiple spots. But uh, if it's N9HEP, I know that that repeater is only located within uh, a geographic area, if you will. So let me change that back real quick. There we go. And of course, if you just don't set the name, which I'll show you how to do in that next episode, Whenever you go to a memory channel, you'll just see the frequency if there's no name set. So that should be a pretty good indicator. Uh, up to a thousand memory channels. Most of the stuff on the memory channels that when programming it, you could access by the shortcut menus by hitting function and a certain keypad number, which is really nice. Another feature this has is what they call memory banks. The memory banks, uh, there's up to 10 memory banks that you could use and you could access. And what does that all mean? Well, let's just use two for this example. Let's just say also for this example, we are typically in two locations, meaning we're in Chicago and we're in San Diego quite a bit, okay? You know, when I'm in Chicago, I don't really need to scan or listen for San Diego frequencies. So maybe I make a bank of frequencies or memory channels that have been saved that are, you know, typically only heard in the Chicago land area. We call that VHF shy. Okay. And then our second one being San Diego. Maybe we made that memory bank called VHF San or something along those lines. And really just to access your different memory banks, uh, I'll get more into that depth on this when we get into the programming video, but you hold down the band button. And right now you can see I have no bank selected, but if I use that selector knob again up top, I can go between the different memory banks. And so if I were to select bank one, uh, boy, I don't really remember now. Let's see, I think it's this one. Nope, I turned on a scan. Okay, so I'm gonna turn that off. I'm gonna go back into here. I'm in bank one, and then I hit band again. Now I'm in as indicated on here, I'm in a memory bank. And if I were to use the selector, there I am on channel two and channel one. So those would be my Chicago frequencies. I could do the same thing. I could access the 
the banks go to bank three and these would be my simulated San Diego frequencies select it and yeah I did have you know the same thing on there as well but uh, that's pretty much just a basic rundown of like what the different banks banks do again we'll go into that in a lot further detail in another episode Hey, one of the things I wanted to bring up real quick, in order to access those memory banks, you have to be in the memory mode. I don't think I mentioned that in the video, but like right now I'm in VFO mode. Uh, I have to switch over to a memory mode. And once I'm in the memory mode, I could then access the banks. But if I try to do that in VFO mode, uh, I won't be able to do so. I do also want to point out there are a lot of features on this radio that I might not go into a lot of detail about, like the arts feature, but it's still a really good feature to have and it might intrigue you, so I'm going to tell you about it. Arts, I believe, is known as um, automatic range transponder system, something along those lines. And in short and in layman's terms, what does that do? Well, if you have it enabled on the radio and you have everything set up on, on multiple radios, really, Whenever those radios are within close proximity to each other, you may be alerted. And as the Yezu manual suggests, and I actually do agree with, is that could be useful in operations like search and rescue. Or, I mean, if you're going out somewhere, like I said, this doesn't have a Vox capability, so I can't use my, um, my all-in-one cable to beacon my APRS. So maybe the arts feature is another feature that I utilize to ensure that if something happens to me, at least uh, if somebody's in my general vicinity with those same settings enabled, they'll be able to know that I'm in that area and they'll kind of know where to look. So arts could be a very useful thing for some people and, and I could definitely see that. Now, we're gonna jump back into the menus though and I'm trying not to get too far off a of track, but there is a lot of features here in the menu. So again, I'm in VFO mode and here in VFO mode, the first thing I want to point out is you're probably seeing a bunch of icons that are on the top of the, the LCD. And we're going to kind of go through those as we go through the menu. Because as we go through the menu, those options change, okay? So, for example, right now you see a clock that you didn't see before, probably a, a, a scene or two ago, right? So I'm going to hit function and then zero. We access the menu. Now to access the menu, there's, I think I said 50, yeah, 56 different options on here. We're not going to go through all 56 because the video is long enough as it is. But we are going to go through some of the, the more interesting ones. Uh, I don't want to say that. I don't want to offend anybody. The ones that I, I find to be the most utilized, okay? Uh, so number one, automatic power off. And that's where that clock came from up there. So when the automatic power off is enabled, you'll see a clock on the upper portion of your LCD. Now to change that, it shows the APO is selected. And if we hit menu, we basically dive down into the automatic power off options like this. Now I have, I think up to 12 hours, I could have this off. And when I have it off, you'll notice that the clock goes away. But as I set it to on for half an hour of not being used, no receive, no send and so forth, it'll shut off. You know, uh, you can go all the way up to 12 hours in half hour increments. So for this case and scenario, I suppose, I'll just put it at two hours. And to save that, I'm just gonna hit the function button again, which brings me up to the menu, and you'll see I'm at menu option one again. Now I could scroll through the different menu options by use, utilizing that switch, if you will. Automatic repeater shift, what is that? Uh, quite frankly and simply, it's on by default and it probably is good that it stays on, but uh, it could be changed for certain reasons. When you're on a frequency, for example, on VHF, you may find a frequency that you want to input that's a repeater, like the one you see above. Now this happens to be one somewhere in Boulder, Colorado or Colorado. However, uh, what we see is we see the frequency and then we see that there's a minus 0.6 offset. And that's standard for two meters, okay? And in UHF, 70 centimeters has its own standard as well, which is probably 500 megahertz. What does that mean? Well, depending on where you are on the band, it might be a plus or a minus offset and so forth. The radio will guess, essentially, that the automatic repeater shift is gonna be minus 0.6 so that you don't have to 
uh, manually put that in every time. Now there are times where the repeater shift is going to be different uh, than the standard. And in those situations, maybe you would disconnect or excuse me, um, turn off the automatic repeater shift. And we do see the same kind of thing for everyone. If we wanted to go in there, automatic repeater shift set to off or on, I selected on. And when I select it to on and I hit the function button, it saves it. Then I can go on to the next option, okay? Like I said, there's a lot of different options on here that we could go over. Um, do you like this beep? Every time you hit that beep, it, you know, you could probably turn that off. I don't like that though. And I will, this is a good point, and I will make a note of this right now. Uh, I do have a friend who's, uh, who's unable to see, and he relies heavily on voice activated commands, if you will. And I don't think that Yezu has the opportunity to tell you what frequency channel you're on or what frequency you're on. So this, as far as I'm aware, uh, and this is why I don't like to speak about these things is I don't have a lot of knowledge into them and I don't want to give you misinformation, but I'm also in a position where I've been asked many times to say if it's uh, user accessible for uh, sight uh, impaired individuals. And uh, the answer I don't, I think is no, I, I, we, we get beep tones, but beep tones aren't going to tell you anything, unfortunately, but you could turn on and off those beeps if you wish. I'm going to leave mine on, you know, it's nice to know. What is the bell feature? Well, the manual says that during CTCSS decode or DCS operations, you could set up the bell feature uh, to alert you of the fact that a call is coming in. And there's a whole procedure for it, but it's not necessarily something I've ever used. Let's go ahead and just kind of continue on to some of the more common features, if you will. Uh, as I go through this though, you could always pause this and feel free to kind of do a little research by typing into Google what some of these things do or download the manual. Uh, I will provide a link if I could find one to Yezu's website for the manual. But again, you go through this menu option and you could do things like, here's another very common one. Do you want your lamp disabled? Let's go into here real quick. And it says key, it's toggle key, S S E C. So let's see what each of these does. Okay. Key lamp key. So what does that do back in the main menu? We're going to wait just a second here. If I now hit that button on the side, which is the lamp illumination, doesn't necessarily do anything particularly different than how we had it. So if we go back into that menu, Oh, I went to program a actual, uh, repeater frequency. Let me just go ahead and set that for now. But if we go back into function zero, here's lamp again, key. What about SSEC? I should probably mention that SSEC is really five seconds or five SEC. Sometimes it's very difficult to see when I'm looking down and recording. No excuses though. Now you know. going to be completely off but I could still hit it here let's see now what if I type in frequencies it doesn't come on so the lamp is only going to come on an SSEC if I hit it on the side here okay and then let's go back into the menu one more time now you're going to know that I'm ready to access the menu if when I hit the F button, the function button, an F appears here. If you don't see the F, that means you're not ready to access the menu. And then if you hit zero, you're going to activate wires, which is a whole nother feature for a, a whole nother day. But uh, function and then zero, we're back in the menu, hit lamp again, and then toggle. Okay, so now we're on the toggle feature of the lamp. I could turn it on, I could turn it off. What about uh, typing in a frequency now? It's off, but wait, I could turn it on and it's gonna stay on, just watch this, okay? So um, let's just hold it for a second here and it shouldn't go off. You know how before it was going off after a certain amount of time, this is gonna stay on all the time. As you can see, it's staying on all the time. I do wish that there was a way to either brighten or dim it or maybe you have a different light. But again, we're talking about a radio that's nearly 20 years old. They didn't know how to change lights back then. I'm kidding. So anyway, let's go back into the menu system. And I like my lamp to just kind of be on when I type a key or when I hit a key. 
So it will shut off now on its own after a certain period of time. Boom, shut off. But if I hit the button, good to go. So I think you get the point of lamp. So to recap, just in case you didn't get that uh, toggling, you are in charge of toggling it on and off. So whenever you toggle it, it will go on or off. Uh, five seconds. If you hit that button on the side, that's the only time the light will illuminate. After five seconds, it will shut off if you don't touch anything. And then, of course, you have your keypad, which every time you hit a keypad, it illuminates the uh, the keypad or the, the lamp, if you will. Next up, I have put the, the Redifice long antenna on here. In fact, I might switch out to the antenna that goes uh, up to the attic. And the reason for that is uh, we want to try to receive some airband. Uh, I turned off some of the, in fact, I'll probably turn off the other lights around here to reduce the interference that you might hear in the form of static on the radio because I try to give this an accurate representation. I believe that the radio sounds great. I do also recognize that there's a lot of stuff around here that's probably causing static you may hear. But with the lar larger antenna, we should be able to receive some air band, which, you know, if you're in the radio, in order to access the air band, again, we could set up these memory banks and everything, but uh, real briefly, if we just went to our VFO mode, and when we're in our VFO mode, right now you're gonna see the show's FM, but if we find a frequency that does air band, so for example, I think that that's one in my area, 120.550, you'll notice it switches to AM because obviously, this radio uh, receives air band and air band is AM. You might ask me, will this transmit on AM even with a hack or whatever? And, and truthfully, I think the answer is no. I don't know of any way to do that. Maybe there's some really big brains out there that can, but to answer your question, this doesn't transmit on AM. And I'm just so sorry. Uh, you know, we'll make a whole another episode where uh, we actually drive somewhere where there's busier air traffic, I suppose. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and just listen to some NOAA weather radio to give you an idea how this sounds on FM. NOAA weather radio being a FM wideband. The risk. Discussion. The continued dry conditions in combination with winds gusting upwards of 20, 30 miles per hour this afternoon will make for an elevated risk of grass and brush fire spread. And now I am in Chicago. Right Ohio there. Was sunny. Hold on. The temperature was 70. Right there. You hear a difference between their uh, a noticeable static within the the receive of the signal. And then there was absolutely no static and everything was crystal clear. And that is an indication of uh, all this interference from the camera and the lights that's occurring. Okay. So if I move it further back, you might have a harder time hearing it. Airport. But, but that's gone. Wisconsin. That's gone. Milwaukee, Wisconsin reported 72. Madison, Wisconsin reported 78. And now that should just be an indicator of how this sounds on the uh, on the receive. The next thing I will do, and it will be very difficult again because of the the RFI and the noise. But I'll give you a brief demonstration of how this sounds when listening to it as if I was transmitting from here. And to do that, I'm going to, I'm going to go do a simplex frequency where I shouldn't be bothering anybody. So the, we're going to use a simplex frequency on two meters. And, and as I do that, I actually want to show you when I go to this simplex frequency, 147.405. Yeah, there you go. You notice that the minus sign on here disappeared on the screen, on the LCD. That's because this is a simplex frequency and that doesn't require a repeater shift. And so it's no longer gonna use a repeater shift. Let me just turn off all codes as well here, but then I'm gonna transmit on another radio being the Yezu FT3D. I think it's only fair to do Yezu to Yezu. And, uh, and you're gonna get an idea how this sounds, okay? Hey, I also wanted to point out that when I disable the tones by just hitting function and going to the squelch type, turning it off, uh, that's when on the main screen, the T disappears. So if you don't see the T, there's no tone. Again, I just want to point out that I make these videos with the radios that I receive. I've never been paid by or received a radio from Miezu. I just want to make that apparent because some people think that. And uh, regardless, I just hope that you're enjoying these videos and it gives you some kind of idea of whether this radio is right for you or not. Actually, I do want to just 
if you don't want to watch this, hey, you could fast forward one minute. I won't be offended. I thank you for watching. Hey, I'm very grateful, and I think that if you've made it about 50 minutes in, that you're you're liking what you see. Now, maybe my request today, I think I've already asked for likes, comments, and subscribes, but maybe the request is better than that. Maybe if you like what I do, and I have a whole catalog on handy talkie radios, Yezus, uh, ICOM, IC705, not really handy talkie, but you get the point. And those are some of my best videos. Why? Because I can go into depth and detail about everything that these radios have to offer and I do a good job, I'm detailed. I've heard people who hate me say that. And the thing is though, is when I have to buy, uh, for example, an FT3D, an FT70D, the FT4X, the XT65, and I got the 60R for free, but I think you get the point. The, uh, even when we start to get into the FTDX10 and so forth, this starts to become a huge financial burden for me. Maybe it would be awesome if today you could just, if you like this video, tag one of these companies like Tag Yezu, or if you see one of my icon videos, tag icon and say, hey, uh, the channel Ham Radio Dude, that guy made a really good video about this radio. And I would really appreciate it. But anyway, thanks for listening if you did. And if you fast forward it, Welcome back. This is W9FFF testing. Is this frequency in use? Nothing heard. W9FFF testing the transmit quality of the Yezu FT60. This is W9FFF, and I'll be clear of the frequency. Right, so this little radio right here, the Yezu FT60, I gave you a, I want to call it a brief overview of this radio today, but we did go over some details of this radio to include how much power it outputs, its uh, type of receiver that it uses, what type of antenna it uses, how it sounds on transmit and receive, and we'll get into that a little bit more detail in the future. And don't forget, in the future, we're going to go ahead and manually program this radio so that we could put frequencies in there, add them to banks, and so forth. And hey, maybe we could even take it a step further and figure out how to program this on a computer, as that logically would be the next step. Uh, but there is a lot to offer in this small radio here, as you saw and hopefully heard today. I'm, like I said, not here to convince you whether or not to buy the radio, but I did want to provide you this overview so that when you're ready to purchase a radio, if this is on your consideration list, it is something that you may consider. Uh, now, to give you an idea, it's currently 2023. Yeah, June 2023. And I'm going to leave you a link below to the FT60, actually a few of them. The first link I'll leave is an Amazon affiliate link. If you click on it and you don't purchase it, I understand it's a lot more money at $189 for the Yaesu FT60R. But if you go to a place like Ham Radio Outlet, the price of the Yezu FT60R, as I'm recording this in 2023, is about $154. So check out Ham Radio Outlet. They have multiple locations around, also not sponsored, not affiliated, not associated, but they do have multiple locations around the United States where you'd be able to purchase the radio. So with that, I hope this episode helped you. I hope you do at least consider the FT60, and if you get it, I hope you enjoy it. Whatever the case might be, I hope this video was educational to you and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, do me a favor. You thought you knew what was coming next, but you didn't because I was going to tell you to have a great day and enjoy it. Thanks for checking this out, 73.